Right. So, if I say that God has power, then that implies that there are things over which he has power. So, it implies the existence of something outside of his power. If I say that God has knowledge, then it implies that there are things that exist or will exist that he knows. And we'll talk about that in detail. But when we say life, then it does not necessarily imply that. This is what our theologians reason. However, this brings up an interesting question. And that is the nature of the created world. And this is a question that is not usually talked about in um, theology, but it's a very interesting question that is this creation alive or not? And um, is it inanimate and animate or not? It's typical of human beings, of course, as we all do, to divide the world into the animate and the inanimate, into the living and the non-living. And we don't make this an issue of theology. Okay, this is regarded to be a peripheral matter which pertains to sound belief but it is not required belief. And therefore if you are comfortable and only comfortable with the obvious dichotomy in the world between the animate and the inanimate then stay with that. There's no problem. But Many of our scholars prefer not to use that cognitive frame. Again, cognitive frames are very important. And cognitive frames, as you know, are these understandings, these um, frames of understanding that we put on the world. And they affect the way that we see the world. And it's very important to have exact cognitive frames. We'll see, for example, when we talk about cause and effect, that we have this amazing word, sebeb. And we use the word sebeb for what an ordinary person would call a cause. But when we look at the word sebeb, we will see that it is a very precise word, because it only in indicates the linkage between A and B it does not indicate that A actually causes B. So it's a very powerful cos uh, cognitive frame. And we'll talk about that later, okay? All right? But um, the accurate cognitive frame to speak about this world that many of our scholars have is that it's not divided between living and dead but it is divided between samit and natik. It is divided between that which is silent and does not speak, like the pillar, and that which is natik, like you, or like the bird, or like the whale in the sea, or the angels, or the spirits. Okay, and that is a very careful description of reality because whether you know we do not doubt that this type table does not have organic life okay it doesn't grow it doesn't reproduce uh, you know it doesn't move on its own it doesn't have children okay so it is not organically alive that we could agree on there's not a problem with that but is it actually dead in the sense that it has no perception and it has no relation to anything outside of itself, uh, that's a question that you and I really can't say. We don't have access to that. And especially in the light of Revelation, we know from the Qur'an and we know from the Hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that everything in existence glorifies its Lord. 
everything in the existence yusabbihu bihamdihi. Some people say that's a metaphor, that the, the, the stone doesn't actually glorify God. That's just a metaphor because the stone, in order to exist in the realm of possible being, it points always to necessary being that willed it to be. The atom cannot account for itself. The atom points always to its creator, just like the watch points to its maker. All things are like that in the realm of possible being. But many of our scholars take this literally, that everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies God. And this is what I believe that everything in the universe is alive. It's like, is there life in outer space? There's only life in outer space. There's only life here. And some scholars say this is by virtue also of the fact that God himself is a living God. So therefore, when he creates, he imp imparts the gift of life in different ways to everything. And again, when we look at the atom that we've talked about many times, this is absolutely beyond imagination, that this is an incredible thing. You know, the electron going around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. How can it exist? How can it continue to exist? We cannot take these things for granted. And in its reality, it's tasbih. It is the glorification of God. It is the praise of God. It declares the greatness of God. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbaru Kabira. So that is a very, I believe, sound way of looking at creation. And the cognitive frame that we use for that is to divide reality between the speaking and the not speaking, not between the living and the dead. And again, that is honest. I know this table doesn't speak. Never spoke to me. Okay, I know that your chair doesn't speak. It never spoke to me. But does it have any kind of life or consciousness that is unique to it, which is not organic? I don't know that. This is something that could only be known by remarkable experience, like the rocks that gave salams to the Prophet in Mecca, before his prophecy, and he would say, this is the rock who gave me salam. And he stood on the mimbar in Medina, right, which was made of a date palm. And this was his mimbar. And authentic traditions tell us that when the carpenter came, the carpenter boy, and he made the mimbar for the Prophet. And the Prophet didn't stand on the old mimbar that was made from the date palm, that it began to weep like a baby. And the Prophet came down from the mimbar and he embraced it. And then he asked it what it would like. And he gave it the choice of different things, and among them if it would be in the garden with him, and it accepted that. And then it didn't weep. Okay, is this irrational? Absolutely not. Is this extraordinary? Yes, it's miraculous. And this is why also we have to know the possibility of the possible. That the realm of the possible is an infinite realm. And God does in that whatever he wills. He does in that whatever he wills. This is again why when we speak about experience, and empirical reason, we speak about ada, which is customary experience, implying by that cognitive frame that there is also experience which is not customary, like miracles. And miracles are true. And we have miracles in the lives of the messengers and the prophets, and we have miracles in the lives of saints. And you can see them in your life right now. And maybe you have seen them in your life. You know, Allah does amazing things. That's not customary. 
I remember when I made pilgrimage from Egypt, that was my first pilgrimage in 1973, December of 1973. It was December 1973, January 1974. Um, you know, I was a student here, I went to make pilgrimage, and I lived in Zemalik, and there was a little mosque in Zemalik where I would pray. And the imam was a very simple man, you know, it was a little tiny mosque, and he was a shopkeeper. And so I go to Mecca, it was an incredible experience. Absolutely, in fact, I saw the haram even before I got there in dreams. The whole thing. And I'm just walking like in a daze. And I went to the second floor of the haram so I could watch the Kaaba. I just couldn't take my eyes off of it. And watch the people come in. The Senegalese, the Turks, the Caucasians from Central Asia, and every race on the face of the earth. I couldn't go to sleep all night. And then in the morning after subh and after sunrise, I turned around and who was sitting behind me? It's the Imam from Zamanik. He didn't know I was making pilgrimage. I didn't know he was making pilgrimage. But he ends up right there behind me. Did that happen by random? I mean, that's, it's a chance. I didn't intend it. He didn't intend it. But Allah does things like that, right? And it's to make you strong in your faith. It was beautiful. We embraced each other, we were happy, we had breakfast together, and so forth, right? So Allah does in the realm of possible being whatever He wills. And for you to see miracles, you have to get the tartib rabbani. You have to get the proper ordering of the self, which is living by the sharia, living with the aqidah, and then you, you will see amazing things. You do see amazing things. So, you know, the world is alive. Everything in it is alive. The atom is alive. You know, the uh, molecules are alive. Fire is alive. All of these things glorify God. And all of them are the servants of God. We are the only problem. We are the problematic one. Because we are given the gift to obey or disobey. And the jinn who are our counterparts, they're also like that. They have this ability to obey or disobey. <clears throat>